coming to Indonesia Jentra School of Law, especially to uh, Alex Gil Kastermans, and then also Mr. Adrian Bedner that already come here to uh, Indonesia Jentra School of. Law. Uh, maybe I could introduce the Indonesia Jentra School of Law briefly. Uh, Indonesia Jentra School of Law was established in 2011, established by uh, PSHK, Pusat Studi Hukum dan Kebijakan Indonesia, Indonesian Center for Law and Policy Studies. Uh, PSHK itself uh, established in 1998, and then uh, we work in law reform, mainly in two areas, in parliamentary issues and then in the judici judiciary issues. And then in year 2000, we established hukumonline.com, one of the prominent legal portal in Indonesia. And then in year uh, 2006, uh, we got a, a contribution, a donation of books from the late Professor Daniel Eslev. And then we established the Daniel Eslev Law Library. It's next door. Maybe after the uh, lecture, we uh, please visit the library. Uh, and then in 2011, we think that it's a reasonable uh, next step that we establish this uh, law school. And then here is the law school. And then uh, since 2011, we, we were honored to already uh, help, uh, I think, eight or nine, nine international lectures. Some of them are from Professor Mark Lott from uh, Supreme Court Justices of Netherlands. And then uh, uh, Professor Pierre Grant uh, from Sorbonne University, Anwar Ibrahim from Malaysia, and then uh, uh, Sebastian Pompa from Netherlands also, and then the, from Judicial Commission of the uh, New South Wales and some other uh, professors. So we are honored to have them to give uh, lecture. And today, uh, it's also an honor, and I would like to present uh, Professor Alex Gibbs Kastermans. And we would like to thank you and welcome, and we'll give the lecture of uh, cor corporations and human rights. Thank you very much. So I would like to give the floor to Professor Alex, please. Thank you very much for introducing me um, and for having me here to, uh, this afternoon. It is really a challenging idea to be part of a law school in the making. And I think that is the most wonderful thing that a researcher can overcome, being able to start a new law school. Um, I, I'm, I'm a vice dean of Leiden Law School, and I discuss a lot with my colleagues how we really would like to organize our school in an other way than our predecessors did. And of course, we are honored to, to be in the footsteps of, of important law scholars. But you know, we're living in new times, and uh, lawyers, judges, people need new things from lawyers. So why shouldn't the law school change with them? And, uh, but then the bureaucracy and the time you have, you have those 1,100 students that start every September, um, you don't want to uh, begin an experiment with 11 student, 1,100 students coming in September. So in one way or the other, the changes we can make are rather small. But what a challenge it must be to start all over again. Congratulations on that. And I wish you all the best with that. And perhaps I can offer already at forehand that if you need any help and inspiration from uh, this old Leiden University, we will be happy uh, to support you. Um, I would like to talk uh, to you about cooperation, corporations for human rights. Now, this might, might sound a little bit weird, corporations for human rights. Perhaps you think I'm going to talk about corporations that deal in human rights. Uh, take a price to it and sell human rights or something like that. Um, no, it's, it's rather simple. What I would like to show to you is how human rights and 
private law, I'm a private law professor, um, really uh, get invo got involved in the, uh, uh, in the past decade or so um, that really in private law human rights matter and how that evolved. That's what I'm going to talk about and I will end with a view on cooperation that really, corporations that really care for human rights, that want to embed human rights in their organization and how that is evaluated by private law. That private law really uh, 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 is open for the influence of human rights. That's where I hope we are going to end. But before that, I would like to bring you to Leiden in 1948, or rather The Hague, 1947. This is Professor Eduard Maurits Meyers, and he was a professor in private law for a long time before the Second World War. And when he was detained in the Second World War in Den Bosch and in Theresienstadt in Germany, he had only pen and paper and he wrote down a whole new idea of how private law should be organized in the civil code. Just like you were re are reinventing law school, he was reinventing the civil code. And after the Second World War, of course, we were all in the spirit of renewal. Of, well, I, I must be a little bit modest. That was in the Netherlands, in Europe. The European part of the Netherlands was considering we have to do things differently. And one of the things that we wanted to do differently was our civil code. We had this civil code dated from 1838, and it really was becoming a non-existing document. We had to turn to case law of the Hoograat, and we had to turn to case law of the lower courts to know the civil law, the private law. And after the Second World War, Mayer's coming back with this new idea of how to organize private law in a new civil code. He was granted with the task of making a new civil code. And that was in the Hague, because that's where our government is, 1947. Unfortunately, he died in 1943 or 4, 1944. And um, Professor Myers, Myers uh, uh, well, had a, a wonderful job done, and, and, and his uh, followers would finish the work. It would take about 40 years. It took us to 1992 to introduce a new civil code. But what I think is very, it's of course coincidental, but when you go to Paris, 1948, there the nations were together uh, working uh, on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So when Mayer started to work on the civil law code, Many, many people were in Paris assembled to work on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there was a lot of talking about that and a lot of writing about that. And then I wonder, did the two ever meet? Did Mayers, he went to Paris a lot because he wanted to study the civil code, of course, and, and how it developed in France. He had contacts in France. Did he ever, was he even interested in the work of these people working on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And with his experience, he was a Jew in the Second World War, I think he should have got some sense that the two were important. Uh, um, that even in exploiting your own private rights, your, your uh, property rights, your contractual obligations, we have seen many, many examples that people were treated wrong because they were, for example, Jew or were black or were uh, women. Uh, um, th this civil code was not neutrally uh, 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 um, executed in a way. So there, there, there would have been a reason uh, to think, at least think about um, our civil code and the relation to the development of human rights 
uh, in Paris 48. But I'm afraid that it didn't, it didn't happen. Um, no, because um, um, I think human rights were considered then and still are as a matter of the state uh, towards the citizens. Citizens are granted human rights and the state should take care of human rights of the citizens. And um, there was no reason to do anything with that in the new civil code. Anyway, the task of Professor Myers was to work as an old wise man, not as a revolutionary to uh, think up any new things. Um, although you might say that human rights can be applied through the general clauses of private law. I don't know how familiar you are with private law, but you've got the onrechtmatige daad, the tort. You've got contracts. Contracts have to be interpreted. Uh, you've got all kinds of open norms, general clauses, where you have to take care, to, to take into account all the relevant factors of the case. And it might be that human rights are at stake, that equal treatment is at stake. And it is fairly easy to recognize the norms of equal treatment as uh, uh, important factors to fill in those general clauses of, for example, tort law or contract law. So there are many instances where you can uh, uh, take a look on, on human rights and see how they can be of importance for the implementation of contractual obligations and, and uh, onrechtmatige daad rules. And nowadays we can imagine many cases where uh, uh, um, human rights and private law coincide. I don't know whether you're familiar with the Unicol case, Unicol case in Myanmar. Um, the American company Unicol uh, had to build, wanted to build a plant in Burma, in Myanmar. And to get the land and to uh, get all the, uh, the rope work done, they had to work together with the Myanmar government. And in that process, a lot of casualties happened. People were thrown out of their houses, of their land. Uh, women were raped, people were even killed. In this whole process of the Myanmar government and army to make it possible for Unicol to start their plant. So this was a private company working together with uh, uh, the army of Myanmar. And the question rose whether Unicol um, violated a duty of care vis-a-vis -vis the citizens, the communities, around the plant that they wanted to start, living around the plant where they were about to start. So at one point in time, uh, a procedure was started, a civil procedure, civil proceedings were started in the United States of America. And there was a lot of fuss. Can the American courts um, hear a case that took place in Myanmar with plaintiffs that are Burmese? Uh, what should an American judge do about that? And which norms do we have to apply? So there was a lot of fuss in this case. And in the end, if I'm not mistaken, but this happened, this is happening to me now because I had my notes in my hotel room to bring here and I took the wrong notes. So this is a recollection. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, this case was settled before a judge could deliver a final judgment. Yes, you shake your head. Thank you very much. <laughs> and there were lots of cases uh, before they came to this point, but the, the, the cases were referred through and through. Um, but it was a real case, a real case concerning human rights in private law. The duty of care of Unicor, you could say in short, it was, uh, um, uh, it, it, as a matter of fact, you've got several possibilities under American law to, uh, to turn to Unicor. And as a European lawyer, as a Dutch lawyer, I would say this was about the duty of care of Unicor. The same counts for 
this case of Firestone in Liberia. I don't know if you have to change your tires every now and then, your car, then perhaps you might ask for Firestone tires. And uh, perhaps then you are interested how the rubber is being taken from the trees in Liberia. Um, that was a hell of a job for especially the children on the rubber plants in Liberia because the workers on the plantation had tasks that would, uh, 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 that would make them work for more than 24 hours a day. You have to tap so many trees uh, in a day to, to receive your, your loan and if you don't you get only half of the loan and well, what happened was whole families went into the plantation to reach the targets. And here were very brave men and women, they went to court again in America um, and again it did not come to a final, uh, um, a final decision of American courts um, I think it was three years ago when for the first time in Liberia, Firestone uh, uh, concluded a collective labor agreement with proper wages, proper working hours, and even setting up schools for the children of the workers of the plantation. I told this story once to alumni of Leiden University, and I was a little bit cross about how could people run a plantation in that way nowadays, in the, uh, at the beginning of this new century? And then it turned out that one of the sons of these, well, very valuable alumni <laughs> was head of one of those plantations in Liberia. And he came to me and said, well, you know, um, my son was always under the impression that the people working in my, on my plantation were better off than the people who didn't have a job on a plantation because they get a loan and they get a house and they get some food for the families. And I think this is, this is really what it's all about. It's very hard to be very, hard, uh, to very precise in what, which norms should be followed and, and, and you have to uh, be very subtle about how you uh, use the norms in the one country and the other country. So I, you, you're not going to hear me use very nasty uh, words on, on all, all the uh, companies that you will see today uh, because I recognize that there's not one single norm in private law to be taken care of. Uh, that might vary from country to country, um, case by case. But I thought that was, this was rather harsh and the old man said, no, my son was of another opinion. Okay. And perhaps we should add to this line of cases also the Exxon Mobil cases in Aceh. Aceh was spelled this way on an American site called Business and Human Rights. Is this the proper way of writing Aceh? I, felt, I'm, I myself thought it was written another way, but this is correct, okay. This is Exxon Mobil in Aceh who also needed to collaborate with the police in, uh, in Aceh. And terrible things happened there as well. Uh, 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 local people uh, have troubles with the police um, and also Exxon Mobil was taken to court again in America, District Court of Columbia, Federal District Court in Columbia and we've, got, we've seen already several cases being dealt with by the American courts, federal courts, it's still not ended and I think they, they didn't settle the case yet. No. So, private law and human rights, um, perhaps it was unthinkable in 1948, but it's not nowadays. We've got several cases all over the world, in The Hague, on Shell, in Nigeria, in London, uh, uh, corporations working in South Africa, uh, in America, all over the world, Colombia, uh, uh, South America. Uh, I think it cannot be denied that we have to think about the norms that have to be applied by multinational corporations working in other parts of the world in need of a cooperation with, the, with, with governments, with other companies. They have to think about how to handle these very um, touchy cases. 
What I would like to do now is to go with you to some international documents that are about these uh, dilemmas and then turn to the law. I will just look with you to these documents because they might be of some importance for working with general clauses in your private law. You've got your old BV, uh, 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 Civil Code, BV, Burgerlijk Wetboek of 18. 48 it is, and you've got your general clauses in it, like good faith, interpretation of, of contracts is in it, uh, it's the onrechtmatige daad, article 1375 of your old civil code. Uh, perhaps other sources of law have general clauses as well. So what, what I'm interested in, if you could have, could do something with these documents once you know them, to fill in those general clauses. Would they be of any importance? One, one day you have to decide on a case, for example, Axel Mobile and Aceh.